Let's go. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, anyone in the waiting room? We're not letting anybody in, just recording right now. Nobody's in the waiting room, all good. Uh, well, hi everybody, I'm Dr. Tanisha Singleton. I am the president on the board of directors for Black Girl Hockey Club, and I'm very excited to host this webinar session for you all right now. We've got a great lineup of guests and a very thorough agenda, so we're very, very excited um, to be here and to offer you some extra, extra special information for our community that we serve. Um, so I'm super excited right now and very, um, honored as well to have so many great panelists here to be able to give you some cool information. So this is so not about me, but for the sake of time and everything, I'm going to kick it over to our founder and executive director, Ms. Renee Hess, who's going to give you some bio information about our panelists and give you the rundown for what we're going to be seeing today. Yes. Am I on mute still? Okay, good. I'm not. Hi, all. Renee Hess here, founder and executive director of the Black Girl Hockey Club. So I am really excited today to have uh, this informative webinar with some of our uh, BGHC allies and supporters uh, here to talk about uh, how to get into boarding school, how to stay in boarding school and how to play hockey in boarding school. So I'm looking for my bios here and I can't find them. So I'm just gonna go off my brain here. Um, I'm gonna start with coach Mike Watson. Uh, Mike Watson is a BGHC uh, volunteer. You see has got, he's got his BGHC hoodie on right there uh, out of Columbus, Ohio. He works with the Columbus Ice Hockey Club amongst other things. And you've got two boys in boarding school right now, Mike. Yeah, I have one graduate. He goes to school up in New Hampshire, and then I have one that's still there as a senior at Culver Military Academy. Yes, he's at Culver, and you know that means that uh, the Watson family has gone through the boarding school process a couple of times, and even helped some of our uh, BGHC families uh, learn more about the boarding school process. So I am so so excited that he is here. Uh, thank you, Mike, for for joining us today. Uh, we've also got Lisa, Lisa Marshall. She's at Berkshire School, uh, and she is now you're the coach of the women's hockey team you work in admissions you wear multiple hats over there at Berkshire so uh, we are so glad you reached out to us uh, and really we started talking about this idea together of um, having this lovely uh, informative webinar session for our parents. And I'm really glad that you did, Lisa, because I think this is gonna be very impactful for our students. So I'm really excited to have you as a BGHC co-conspirator, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, we've got Nikki Chambers. Nikki, you and I just met uh, last week. Uh, but I am so glad that we did because you work as the Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Belonging at Williston Northampton School. Now, where is Williston Northampton? So hi, everyone. Um, Williston Northampton is located in the Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts. Um, and so I would probably say we're about a little over an hour from our friends over at the Berkshire School. Yeah, we just found out that Lisa and Nikki frequent the same bagel joint, and I think they just became best friends. So that's awesome. I'm so glad that you're here to join us, Nikki. Um, as I mentioned before, as we were getting ready for this session, I believe it's really impactful for young Black girl hockey players to see you, a Black woman who works at a hockey boarding school, ready and willing to uh, help our families get started on this arduous uh, but important process. And so I'm gonna hand it over to you all because we're, we're trying to keep this short and sweet. Um, let's talk about boarding school. Sure, I can, um, I can take a, a kind of the leaping off point and then um, you know, jump in however that might uh, make most sense. 
Uh, so essentially, <clears throat> I, uh, I had the, the opportunity to go to boarding school, so I can kind of represent that as well. But um, it's, it's a little bit different and it's a weird world. If anybody has seen Harry Potter, that might be a great kind of jumping point too, except it's not wizardry at all. None of the staircases move, but it's, uh, you know, you're moving away from home. Uh, typically, there are some boarding and day opportunities. Uh, but essentially, it's it's moving away from high school, uh, or sorry, from home for high school. Um, and it really is an opportunity to gain some independence and maybe hockey can open that door. But what you get from it is um, so much more than that from just uh, interacting with people from all over the world, different backgrounds, um, and, and you name it. And so uh, really sky's the limit. Um, so anybody else? Yeah, I'm happy to chime in. Um, Lisa, I thought, you know, the way you kind of described boarding school being so much more, right? I think boarding schools are such a wonderful environment for students to be both scholars and athletes. Um, so, and the way that boarding schools structure their time, you have ample time to be devoted to your academics and also really be devoted to hockey or whatever sport that you choose to play at boarding school. Um, and I think that boarding schools really provide a place for students to take risks in a way that provides ample support as students are taking those risks. Um, so as you mentioned, Lisa, I also love that you said like, it's kind of like unlike any world you've been to before. I never went to boarding school. Um, and so when the opportunity presented itself for me to work at one, I was, I was also like, well, what does it mean to live in a boarding school and live where you work? And it means that you have this robust and really beautiful community of people who look out for you um, every moment of every day. They become your family. Um, and even when you don't think people are looking out for you, they're checking in on you. They're making sure that you're getting your homework done. They're making, the, they're making sure they're supporting you as you're on the ice when you're off the ice so it's a really comprehensive environment um, for students to learn and play in you know I'll just I'll just dive in from a parent perspective you know and kind of talk about you know all the things at least that Nikki have said are right like and I'll tell you as a parent um, totally exceeded my expectations right and and it's not like I had any expectations because I had never thought as a parent like many of you, that that was an opportunity that would be available to my child, right? And because they had this burning interest in hockey, they were kind of talented at it, but they were also good students. It opened up this door and it really allowed them to step outside of their comfort zones and really set them on a path that, you know, it's almost like, you know, like I always say with kids that they continue to cease to amaze me. And the boarding school environment is exactly that. It, it actually compounds what they bring in the front door. But as parents, you know, one of the things that I learned is there's a support, there's a level of support that we have to give that is different than the support that we give when the kids are going to school, you know, in, in, in the communities in which they live, they're coming home and sleeping in your house, right? So as a parent, you have to evolve as your child is evolving too as well. And, and for me, if you're able to do that, then you're really opening for your child a, a world that will be a wonderful opportunity for them to, um, you know, fill with, you know, networks and families and friends that they'll, lifelong friends, right? Lifelong friends, right? And, and that's what, and that's really what we hope for, for any endeavor that our kids have. One of, to, to kind of continue with what Mike was sharing and um, one of, and, and almost what Renee was sharing too, of the many hats that uh, people who work at boarding schools, most of us live at boarding school as well. Um, so I'm, at, I'm actually zooming in from a dorm. Uh, I live in a dorm apartment. I'm a dorm head. And so um, I'm one of those people who uh, every week I'm on duty uh, at least one night a week. And I check in 36 girls that go to school here um, and make sure that they're doing their homework and they're going to sleep. And um, one of those kind of integral uh, support systems, there are, you know, obviously coaches, teachers, advisors. Um, and it's something that I truly believe that when a child goes to boarding school, there isn't another moment in their life where more people uh, are invested and care about their success and, and their happiness as well. So um, it's really a, a special kind of recipe um, and you get so much time back in your life because you can walk to everything. 
Um, just think of all the time that you're spending in the car going to this practice, to this practice, back to school, um, and doing all the homework in, in the car too. Um, I don't miss those days, but so much of it is you just walk. Uh, much, many of these places have just incredible facilities where uh, you have immediate access to resources and people alike. Um, you know, prior to working out of boarding school, I worked in undergraduate admissions. And so I was an admissions officer for the better part of eight years. And something that has come to amaze me that I've learned being on campus, observing students kind of navigate their daily lives out of boarding school is how much this experience really prepares them for the realities of being an undergraduate student. Um, students at boarding school learn to structure their time in really important ways. Um, and then they're also learning life skills, like how to do your laundry, um, you know, making sure that you're going to bed on time, that you're waking up on your own. Um, and those may seem like skills that feel kind of um, mundane, uh, but part of watching students adapt to their freshman years at college, you watch them kind of learn to do their laundry and learn to get up on time for class and seeing how they're learning to manage their schedule. and boarding school students really walk away with those skills by the time that they graduate. So you really walk into your undergraduate career a step ahead of the rest of the crowd. You know, Lisa, Nikki, I can, I can jump in on that because I think you bring up a great point. Um, by the time my son went to college, it, it's amazing. Drop off literally was like, okay, see you later. Right. There was, you know, because we had you had already been through that as a parent. Right. You've been dropping your kid off for four years as a parent. So this is just the next journey. And then all around you, you're seeing people bring all types of furniture and you're thinking as a parent, you're like, why are you doing that? You have to move that out. You can't fly your kid back and forth with that futon sofa, you know, that's just sticking up in the room. But you're so right. By the time they get to college, not only are they prepared they're also prepared to advocate for themselves as well. Because that's one of the things in the boarding school environment that is heavily stressed is your child becomes an advocate for themselves, right? And so they know how to take advantage of the services. They know how to seek out that counseling from adults. You know, all those things that, you know, kids have to learn, you know, when they go to college, the kids that are in a boarding school environment, they've already been through that process. Mike, you saying that really brought up uh, when I, before I came back to work in boarding schools, I was actually coaching college hockey. And so we had students come from all different kinds of hockey programs and, and the prep school kids. It was so amazing to watch them uh, where when we would get the hockey schedule and maybe we'd be leaving early on a Thursday for a Friday, Saturday road trip or something. The kids who'd gone to boarding school before we had to tell them had already reached out to their professors and said, hey, I'm going to be missing these three days in the next semester. Can we be on top of it? I'm communicating now. And it's like the kids coming from uh, other kind of uh, schooling hadn't even thought about it. So the advocacy is really um, uh, kind of prevalent in all areas of life, I think. I completely agree, agree, Lisa, and I feel like we're harping on this a lot, but I think it's really important, right? Like, because when you're going through the, the experience of boarding schools, you might be thinking about how does this kind of translate to the world beyond boarding school? Um, because boarding schools can be such a bubble, which I think is a great thing. Um, but when you're in college and you're thinking like, how do I work smarter, not harder? I have all of these classes. Um, how do I manage my schedule? our students really leave with all of those skills. They know how to talk to an advisor. Um, they know how to advocate for themselves when they're talking to a professor um, and they need extra support. Um, and those are really skills and that level of social capital that you gain by being in a boarding school environment is really something that I think our students take with them beyond the undergraduate experience and into the workforce and into um, advanced degree programs too. So it really is just a catapult um, into various degrees of success. Nikki, Lisa, you know, your words so resonate with me so much because I think when I first started looking at boarding schools for my kids and so much I didn't know, 
maybe, you know, we can transition at this point and really talk about kind of that boarding school, that process, right? That process starting with, okay, what school is right for my child and talk through, through admissions and things like that, because that was the piece where I really swirled as a parent because I didn't have anybody to really guide me. Mm. I'm happy to, to jump in there from a couple different perspectives. When my family and I, when we went through the process, it was essentially, I'm originally from Virginia and uh, we had a coach that said, hey, this school needs a, a goalie. Maybe you should look. And I looked at one school and was like, great, if I get in, I'll go. Okay, no, you should like make a list and, and really do some research. There are a couple of different avenues. Uh, so one thing is like, uh, there are schools called New England uh, like NEPSAC. So it's New England Prep School Athletic Conference. There are 53 schools that offer girls hockey. Um, and then there are other academies, some that you might have heard of, or like Shattuck St. Mary's, um, BK, Selects in Rochester, um, and then some independent like Culver and things like that. Um, so there are a lot of different options geographically, location-wise, things like that too. Um, where, you know, they all have different models. So you can, there's, there truly is a school out there for everyone. It's just, um, I really recommend looking at a lot of different things and, and create some pros and cons. You may not know what you need or want, but a lot of it is like going and visiting these schools and setting up appointments. Um, and so just like a brief timeline for NEPSAC schools is that you visit in the fall and the winter of the year preceding um, so say if you're in eighth grade now and you want to go for ninth grade, now's the time you're looking and visiting and things like that. Uh, you'd book a visit where essentially you'd have most places like a student led tour guide um, around campus and then an interview with an admission officer. Um, so about two hours or so for each visit. Um, and then you can, you know, watch practices or, or interact with different kids on campus. Uh, applications are then due. January 15th and it's kind of a robust process of all these different things it's it's almost like applying to college um and then March 10th is when most schools will share the school decision whether it's you're in or not or waitlist and then you families typically have a month to decide uh where their child uh, wants to go to school <sighs> that was a lot but that's uh that's kind of the gist of things in in 20 seconds I see we're starting to get some questions come across. So, you know, I'm just gonna, you know, I throw it, Nikki, at least so one of one of you, you know, choose the answer. So the first one is someone who's on the East Coast of Canada, you know, this is all new to them. Have they even start to find out about what schools are out there? Also, finances are a real concern. So maybe let's talk about okay, the initial research and then also talk about, you know, the financial aid process too as well. So Nikki, I'll throw it to you. You can start. Yeah. Um, so I will say that um, how do you find out about these schools? I think that NEPSAC, uh, that NEPSAC resource that's going to be, I think, attached to your flyer is a great place to start if you're looking at New England boarding schools with robust hockey programs. That's a really great place to start. Um, and I would also recommend talking to directors of financial aid uh, because a common misnomer is that boarding schools take only rich students, and that's not true. Um, we have robust financial aid offerings. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe you'll get the whole thing covered based on your family's need. You might get part of it covered that makes this actually affordable. Um, and we also know that families will apply to boarding schools and may have to say the defining factor of which uh, that will decide where my child goes is going to be based on cost as well. Um, but, you know, don't let the sticker price deter you from applying because many schools have a lot of financial aid to offer its students. All right, I'm just gonna keep rapid fire questions because we got some good, we got some doozies coming in. I so see. Lisa, Lisa, this one's for you. Can you expand on how boarding school helps students build character? Uh, you know, with many parents, you know, um, their child's time at home being reduced, is there a concern from parents that they're losing the opportunity to raise, coach, and influence their child? 
Sure. Um, so this is something that I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for partnership. Um, and for if anyone who might have teenagers at home, I, uh, I really could identify with this and then see it now, now that I'm a coach and an advisor and a dorm parent too, um, is that often I'll get a parent who will reach out to me and be like, can you just say this to my child because they're not listening, but if you say it, they will. And then I'm like, sure, I can absolutely do that. Um, and so as much as there, there is time away from home, I think the time spent at home is much more appreciated. Um, and that was something too of, I'm the youngest of four, uh, four kids. And so when I went back home for those major breaks, like Thanksgiving um, or winter break uh, or spring break, um, I, I felt that that time at home was actually better spent. We didn't bicker. Um, and I really, I think I did listen to my parents a bit better as well. Um, but there, there's like deliberate programming at a lot of these schools too. Um, like for example, at Berkshire, we do have four life programming every other Saturday and then throughout the week as well with different speakers um, that come in that uh, really like try to educate the whole person as opposed to just a student in one specific class. Um, so there's space given to have a lot of challenging conversations and, um, and really challenge each person to, to live and, and to grow. Yeah, I'll jump in on this one, being a parent, right, too. You know, I found actually the boarding school experience actually created more opportunity for coaching, more opportunity for me to influence my child because my child no longer took me as the parent for granted, right? And so, so one of the things is when they came home, like Lisa was saying, they were interested in kind of what I had to say, and as crazy as it sounds, your teenager will never say, hey, you know what, mom, you know what, dad, I missed you, but I could tell with the types of conversation that I was having that they did, and also what I found was, you know, when I wanted to call and I really wanted to talk about something, whether it was grades or whether something that was happening in hockey had that focused attention because they understood that time, time is valuable, right? When you, when you take that away, then what happens is what you get back is someone who now appreciates the role that you as a parent play in their life. And the reason why I said it's additive is because you also now have adults that they respect in their school environment that can hammer home some messages that just don't land well because they're coming from dad and they're coming from mom. Yeah, Mike, I was definitely going to say absence makes the heart grow fonder. And oh, yeah. that sentiment is no more like greatly dis um, expressed when you see students who are dropped off, you know, at, during, you know, the beginning of the school year and watching them kind of forge their independence and no one's saying there won't be challenges along the road. But I think that's the value of boarding school is that there is so much support. I imagine that Lisa is one of at least four or five dorm parents in in yeah five dorm parents right and so you have this whole community of people who are looking out for your child every single day of the week and those people talk right they have regular meetings where they're making sure that everyone is getting the support that they need and we often will call in parents because we 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 need your partnership frankly right we are so many things to students but we'll never be their actual parent and there's and there's absolutely a role for parents um, as your child goes through boarding school. Um, but what you have is just teachers, coaches, advisors, dorm parents, um, residential staff, and, and even thinking about the people on these campuses that are technically quote unquote invisible, dining hall staff who knows, you know, the dietary needs of your kids and, you know, physical plant and housekeeping who know your kids by name. Like this is very much a community where you have so many eyes on your, on your child. Um, so if anything, calling in the parent is in addition to that partnership. And for the, for the students on the call, um, you may not believe me, but it's like uh, when you go, if you were to go to the grocery store right now with your parent and you saw one of your teachers in the grocery store, you'd be like, oh my gosh, we need to go to the other aisle. Like we got to go. Boarding school absolutely flips that narrative where like you can go into the dining hall and I'm sitting there eating dinner. And then you're like, hey, Miss Marshall, I actually forgot to ask you this earlier. How about this? Or like people are in there with their kids. Um, and so it really kind of makes access 
uh, much easier in a way that you don't realize it's happening, but it's a lot different than what you might be used to now. So I'm gonna throw out another question. You know, Nikki, go first. Lisa, jump in. I can jump in third on this one. But this is really talking about the experience of, you know, the experience and processes, you know, for Black students, females, diverse, diverse people from diverse backgrounds. You know, can we, you know, can we talk a little bit about, you know, those unique experiences? Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, because I think it's it, it's good to kind of have that discussion. Right. Because that's the elephant in the room. You know, we're at a event for Black Girl Hockey Club. Right. And so you're taking, you know, these kids into environments, you know, where they could be the only one. So what, mm -hmm. what have you heard about some of those experiences? I, one, am so grateful for this question because it is so critically important that we have this conversation. Um, and as the, you know, as someone in my school community at Williston who stewards the equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives for the entire campus, I can tell you that this is something that boarding schools, this is lifelong work for us. Um, this is work that will not stop anytime soon. This is work where we see the need to improve and we are improving and we are doing the work. Um, I know that for me, when I think about the work that we're doing in terms of equity and belonging, it doesn't just rest with students. Our work is student-centered always, but it also extends to faculty, to staff, to alumni um, and the like. I think when you're talking about boarding schools, being honest that you are engaged, this is going to be a predominantly white campus. What does that mean? Um, and just because the campus is predominantly white, it does not mean that you cannot find community. Um, I am one of the advisors to the Black Student Union, um, and we, our BSU group is a family. We have, we have meals, we go do joyous things off campus, um, they come to me, they'll come to their advisors, even though they have you know, official advisors that help them with classes, they see the adults in that group as additional people that they can go to when they're having a conflict or if they're if they're struggling with something. So um, I, you know, you really can find community at boarding schools if that's what you're looking for. Now, that does not mean that every black student is going to go find an affinity group. I was a student in high school that personally, I was like, I don't think I see um, a reason for me to join an affinity group, um, but I also appreciated having the option to go when I felt like I needed my people. Um, so I think you really do have this opportunity to be in an affinity group where you can kind of bond over this unique experience that you're having on campus that your white counterparts might not be able to relate to. But it also doesn't mean that you're not going to have white friends um, and you're going to find people in your life who are um, who are gonna show up for you and who are gonna be real friends to you regardless of their racial makeup. Um, but there's absolutely space to find community at boarding schools if you are a student of color. You just may have to look for it a little bit. And I think Mike, and you can kind of speak to this from a parent side, you should be asking these questions to any boarding school that you are looking at. If you are, if you wanna hear how they're supporting students of color, how they're supporting black students or however you identify, I think it is critically important that you ask and listen to their response. And if you find that their response might be kind of them patching, you know, a response together. Um, if they're not, if you're not feeling like it's honest, that might give you a taste of what might come when you when you get there. Um, so I would say make sure that you continue to ask those questions as you're looking at boarding schools. Where are the faculty of color? What do they teach? Um, how can I, you know, find an affinity group on campus um, if that's what I'm looking for? How do students of color find belonging um, at a boarding school? Those are questions that really should be asked um, while you're visiting. Nikki, that was an awesome answer. And, and I, um, you know, obviously I want to own that I am a white woman who um, I am on this call as, as an ally and trying to like open up more of these spaces uh, for people that like a lot of boarding schools back when, you know, usually most of them were in the 19, like 1907 and, and sooner or earlier, sorry, um, were typically like made for 
like very affluent white males. Um, and that was it. So Berkshire just started their 53rd year of uh, co-education, meaning we just welcomed um, women to the school 53 years ago. So that's not that long ago. Um, so, you know, I can, uh, I think a lot of uh, boarding schools have their own journeys, but where they are and leaning in into that process uh, with all of those helpful things that Nikki said of, you know, where are the students of color? Where is their, how is their experience? You know, can you speak to them? Absolutely. Um, and how to generate those connections and, um, you know, whether you're on tour or you want to uh, connect over email or something like that. Um, don't be afraid to ask anything. Um, and, you know, you should, you're, you're absolutely, um, you know, expect a good answer or, or the real answer. Uh, but a lot of these schools are, I think, in different parts of their journey. I do. Yeah. You, you know, mm -hmm. you, you both brought up to so many insightful points and me as a parent, you know, living it, having gone through it, I see it. And the thing that I love the most, you know, Lisa, you talk about it, Nikki, you talk about it, ask about it, right? In the boarding school environment, if you got a question, like, I want to know how many diverse kids are at the school. I want to know, you know, do you have incidents from a, from a, from a racial perspective? They will answer the question for you. This is an environment where, where literally nothing is off limits, you know, because the boarding school knows that they're dealing with the things that are most important to parents, their children. So ask those questions, leave no stone unturned. You know, these are all great questions to ask. And if a school, and, and like Lisa was alluding to, schools are on different journeys. And based on where the school is, that might, might, might not be a place that's the right fit for your child, right? But the, the point is, it's still an environment that, that I find is welcoming of the conversation. I can tell, I can tell from my own kids' experience of, you know, they have they had the Black Student Union, they participated in the Black Student Union, you know, they were very open about, you know, current events that were happening around the country, very encouraging of the dialogue. It did happen in the classrooms. Now that was specific to Colbert. It doesn't mean it happened in other places, but I can at least say where my kids were, there was that dialogue. It wasn't one of these don't ask, don't tell type situation mm -hmm. it was like no this is what's going on you know and we're going to tackle it head on and did it make some kids and parents uncomfortable boy you should have you should have read the facebook mm -hmm. page about why is culver stepping into these types of issues culver stepped into those types of issues because the kids were dealing with those and that's how much they the boarding schools care about your child is that they are going to help them navigate even the hairiest of issues that are out there all right, next questions. So let's get into something, you know, hockey specific for, for a second. So Lisa, do all the boarding schools provide a platform for playing hockey at colleges with strong academic programs? Um, I think that a lot of boarding schools will um, help your child figure out what it is that they want to do at the next level. Candidly, I've had kids who came in being like, I want to be a college hockey player. And then they were like, maybe I actually want to play field hockey or maybe I want to play soccer or lacrosse or I have a student this year who could play um, college hockey and she's chosen not to. Um, so I think it really fosters an environment to help your kid learn who they are and who they're not. Um, and even as a hockey coach, it's like, you know, for that one student who's like, I don't actually think I want to do this anymore after high school, it's okay. Um, but with that too, I think that uh, the prep school model, the NEPSAC model is pretty much mirroring of the college um, hockey model, where we usually play about 25 to 30 games, which is just about the, um, the, the, regular schedule for uh, like NCAA. Um, and so from there too, like we, we play two games a week with practice um, four days a week. So at minimum you're on the ice six days a week, uh, which is just a walk away. Uh, so I think that that kind of recipe um, cultivates a really awesome environment for kids who wanna play college hockey to play college hockey. Um, in my time as a prep coach, this is now year six, Every student I've had that's wanted to play college hockey has had the opportunity to do that um, at both division one and division three levels. 
Um, we just had a recent commit uh, last Monday. Um, we've got a student going off to Yale. So we're super excited about that. She's only gonna be a junior for us. So um, it, it's just depending on the student, everything's there. You know, one of the things that I'll say, like having two kids that kind of play play hockey, boarding school provides the platform for them to realize their dreams, right? Mm. Particularly from a hockey perspective. But also, boarding school provides a platform for kids to come in direct contact with the reality of where they are from a skill perspective too as well. In some situations, you have the best of the best, right? And so, you know, you have to take that into account, you know, because if you're used to a child, who's the top player getting all the ice time. When you go into a boarding school environment, particularly at the schools that actively recruit players, you're gonna be on a team that has a lot of best of the best. And then they're into another competitive situation. And what I love about the boarding school environment is you will know where you sit from a hockey perspective by the time the four years are over or the three years mm -hmm. are over. And there's nothing better than to have that clarity, You know, whether it's I need to work a little bit harder or whether it's, you know what, I think I need to go down another path, another door, you know, um, I'm passionate about hockey, but I'm not passionate at that level where I can commit to playing D3 or, or Division One, you know, but I can go and have a wonderful career playing club hockey too as well. And, and, I, and I bring up the different options of continuing to play hockey because they all continue to evolve. You know, club hockey is not a bad moniker. Right. You go to some of these division one club hockey games and these teams are just as good as some of your low level D1 teams. Right. Mm -hmm. They're putting just as many fans, if not more. Right. And so but the beauty in the boarding school environment is any kid, you know, who wants to move on in the game, that opportunity will be there. Coaches will pick up the phone. Coaches will talk very candidly to them because they know the environment that they're in they're used to getting that direct feedback, right? And that's all the kid wants as they're, as they're continuing to progress in their hockey career. And when I field coaches, uh, coaches calls from the college level, it's, it's very few and far between that they're like, how is she as a player? They've already seen you play. What it is, is um, I think the advantage of a prep school coach is they're calling to be like, what's she like in the dorm? You know, how is she as a member of the community? So, I think prep coaches have such an advantage of we see you in every part of your day. And so we can really speak to who you are, you know, when, when no one's watching, are you picking up garbage as you walk to class because you're proud of your campus. Um, so I really think that there's just a whole nother uh, several layers of that kind of prep school connection. You know, and Lisa, one thing, and Nikki, you can attest for this too as well. One thing that I took for granted, you know, when I thought of kind of this boarding school and sending my kids away is the questions that are answered in their favor because they do attend boarding school. You know, so you have schools that are looking at them to say, well, Mike's been living on his own for the past four years. So I, I know they're going to know how to, you know, acclimate and work well in this environment, right? And so, and, and then you just add the academic rigor, rigor in the hockey on top of that or any other sport. Now you have somebody who also knows how to manage their time, who knows how to juggle multiple things. And that really resonates with the coaches. That resonates with the schools because they're getting somebody who's already figured this out. All right. Nick, question for you. And then Lisa, you can take it. Is there a personality type that best fits a boarding school? I'd be very interested to hear Lisa's response to this because my answer would be no. I think that there are so many, one of the unique things about working with teenagers is they're kind of like snowflakes. They really don't make the same one twice. Um, and, and I think that's great. I think that's part of the joy of being able to surround yourself with young people is that they're unique and they're different. And the way that they may experience a school is going to vastly different, is going to vastly differ. But I think that there is so much support at a boarding school that we meet students where they are. Um, and so, you know, seeing as it's nearing the end of September, it's early autumn, 
you know, we've seen students experience, you know, homesickness for a new ninth grader who's just moved into campus and they've never seen a place like Williston before. And it's drastically different than anything they've ever known. Um, and you watch them go through that, but you also see how the community comes and embraces those students. And you'll see a junior or a senior who's been at Williston for three or four years, take that student under their wing and make sure that they're going to the dining hall. They have friends to sit with. Um, We'll, we'll link up with the adults in that person's life and say, the student is really missing home. Like, you know, let's figure out what we can do to kind of make sure that they're adjusting okay. Um, and then you'll have students who are like, I have advisees that are 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And I may have to go chase them down and be like, I noticed you um, are missing a chemistry assignment. What happened with that? Are we going to hand that in? You know, so I would argue that there's no one size fits all boarding student. Our students come to us from different walks of life, experiencing, you know, certain privileges. Some don't experience any, you know, no privilege and have never seen an environment like, um, like a boarding school. And we meet students where they are. Um, and we provide them with the support that they need to get to to meet their own goals in life. So I would say there is no type that fits best with a boarding school. I think that if you want to go to boarding school, you can. And whatever boarding school that is going to be the right, that's going to feel like the right place for you, um, is going to support you however you show up as your authentic self as a teenager. I completely agree, Nikki. And as you were speaking, every example, you, I was like, oh, I've seen this kid. I got that kid. I know what kid you're talking about. Um, but I do think beyond like uh, personality, it's just like a desire to want to be there is really important. You know, at any point of the process, if you're exploring it and you're and you're just like so gung ho, you can feel nerves and like, I don't know, this is new. That's normal. But if, if there's a little part of you that's like, I think I'd rather just stay home, that's okay too. You can learn that throughout the process. But I think just really wanting to be a part of something bigger than yourself and like be in a community with other like-minded peers and, and kind of you're all doing your own thing, but you're all doing it together. Um, that's super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as a parent who, had, who has two kids, two totally different personalities, I would have never in a million years thought my youngest child would have gone to boarding school in a million years. But not only did they go, but they excelled, which totally exceeded my expectations. So Nikki and Lisa, getting back to your point, like there isn't a certain personality type. But what I will say is there is a point where the kid has to say, you know what, I want to be there. I want to give this a try, right? And that, that to me trumps even the personality type is, mm -hmm. does the kid want to be in an environment like that? Because if, if they want to do that, that's what's going to power them when they get homesick. That's what's going to power them when hockey gets difficult. That's what's going to power them when academics get difficult is, no, I wanted to be here. Mm. So Lisa, for you, let's talk about hockey specifically. What are the practice game schedules like for girls hockey at boarding school? And let's talk about the cost. So you throw in the cost into this answer too as well. Sure. Um, so some of the things like the cost of there's, there's a cost of the school and a lot of, um, a lot of the associated costs. Like for example, on the, if you're to play hockey at, um, at a prep school and every school is going to have a different answer. So you should definitely ask money's important. I know it's a whole vulnerability, but you know what? Like you should ask, you need to be informed. Um, and so that's something of uh, at Berkshire, when a kid plays a sport, anytime they go to a game, we travel by bus, depending on the distance. It depends on the type of bus. It's either coaches are driving um, or if it's over an hour, we have a coach bus. All of that is covered by the school. If we miss dinner on the way home, all of those meals, that's covered by the school. Um, that's not... Uh, that's not coming out of the family's pocket at all. That's included with tuition. Um, we do have a one-time uh, cost where if students are coming into the hockey team, um, what I do as a coach is that there are three things every kid on the hockey team needs. And it's like a quarter zip, this one actually, um, a hoodie and a jacket. And we keep it the same every year so that it's you know, $246 
on the nose, but then it's only a one-time purchase. Families know going into um, the school year, that's an expectation coming up in the winter. Um, skate sharpening is free. All ice is free. Um, the schedule, we're super lucky. And I know Williston's ice was down all summer too, where we have open ice from six in, in the fall. So the second week of school, um, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. every morning, 6 to 8 p.m. every evening as well. Um, you can be on the ice for like 20 something hours a week. I don't recommend it. That is too much. Um, but that's just in the fall. And then once the winter happens, as I mentioned before, we have practiced Monday, Tuesday, game on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, game on a Saturday. And then there's open ice on Sunday as well. And like Thursday mornings, like it's, uh, you will not want to skate every time there's ice offered because it's just, it's, it's that much, um, which is just such a blessing. The other thing that I wanted to add about the schedule is that the NEPSAC athletic directors are in conversation. So we have, our schedules are very similar in the sense that we all have game days on Wednesday afternoons. So you're not missing class or instruction time um, to go pursue those, or they'll be on the weekend. Um, and again, not interfering with your academic responsibilities. Yeah. So, so. So what I'm hearing is, in, in uh, and I'll tell you, you know, with kids at an independent board, so the schedule is very similar. You know, you usually hit the ice, you know, every day uh, to the point in, in, in your open period because the ranks are usually open, especially as the season approaches. But that's one of the advantages of being at boarding school. You know, the coaches and, and the adults on campus trust the students, right? So, you know, not all of these sessions are monitored. You know, the kids go out, you know, they skate, they go, and then they go back to class. You know, but I, but I think the big thing is, and, and Lisa, you're, you're right, because there's a point where even my kids like, you know, I, I, I've skated enough. Right. And, and, and remember when these kids are growing up, they're always talking about, man, if I just had a little bit more ice time, man, if I just had a little bit more of this, so I could work on this skill or that skill when they get it is really interesting after their first year of being able to have unlimited ice, you know, it, it's not quite what they thought it would be. Right. And so, you know, just remember that parents, even when, you know, you're talking to some of these schools and, and I, if ice time is very important to you, just understand that there's a balance, right? There can also be too much of a good thing too as well, right? And so, you know, just keep that in mind. So, you know, here's another question. If a player wants to attend a prep school and play hockey, should the player contact the coach and say they would like to play hockey for that school? Uh, Lisa, I'm going to add a, an extra thing to this question. Should they send in video when they kind of email the coach? But should the first step be admissions? You know, is the process similar for college recruiting too as well? Any pointers to players or families who are trying to catch the attention of, you know, uh, a Berkshire, a Williston, a Colbert? Um, definitely. So if you go to any of these schools um, and you go to their website, oh, like it's uh, sorry, my chair just creaked. Uh oh, um, but if you go to these schools, um, they all have their own websites and go to the admissions piece. And it says like fill out a general inquiry or initial inquiry or something like that, or even just inquire. Um, and that will go to admissions um, and, and you can fill out like a, a general kind of um, an inquiry where you'll get some information from the school, but I truly, really, really recommend that you find on that website too, like go to the athletics, find the hockey, um, find the coach's email. Um, and if I can help in any way, please, I promise you can't all come to Berkshire or Williston, like however I can be a resource, I certainly will. Um, and so all of that information is, is out there on the web. You just have to do a little digging. Um, so I can help hold the shovel and you can um, just reach out to the coach, let them know who you are, especially for those West Coast families. Um, if you do have video or you're not coming out to the East Coast for a tournament, um, video is is like just amazing, really appreciated. A lot of these teams have um, social media, too. Um, so you can always DM players or, um, you know, whatever you're comfortable with to kind of get an inside scoop, too. Cool. All right. You know, the, the only other thing I would kind of add, add to that 
uh, piece, Lisa, is, you know, the responsibility on the player to, you know, work the hardest, do their best, you know, be consistent, right? Because that's what's going to catch the attention, you know, of the prep schools, right? Because they go to all the big tournaments, they go to all the USA hockey mid and things, right? And they're constantly looking at the kids that stand out. And what's really good about it is if you're doing that and you have a conversation in the email with the coach when they are at those events, they'll seek you out. They'll come watch your games, you know, and, and then if you do well, they'll pull you, they'll pull you to the side. Or what will happen is, and I've heard of cases where, you know, the event happens and then that Monday or Tuesday, an email comes in from the coach that says, hey, you know, I got a chance to watch you. I really liked how you played. Would love for you to come to campus and meet with admissions and meet with the coaching staff so we could talk about, you know, whether whether Williston or Berkshire or Culver are fit for you, right? So, so, so hopefully that 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 answers that question. Nikki, for you, flexibility for students to play other sports. Oh, absolutely. Um, so we have ice hockey players who are playing field hockey in the fall and maybe another sport in the spring, um, because just the way that our calendar works out. Um, our kids are able to really engage and play other sports and not um, just focus on hockey. We also have students who choose to focus on just ice hockey, and that is fine too. Uh, but I think one of the benefits of going to a boarding school is that you do get to try things that you may have never heard of before. Um, and so I think our scheduling really allows for our students to deeply get involved with things that they're passionate about, that they're interested in, uh, but also really provide space for students to try new things. Um, I think that's kind of the point of boarding school is to kind of expand yourself and stretch yourself and kind of put yourself in, in, in different activities and in different experiences um, so that you can be your best self. All right. Next question. To what degree are Canadian prep schools or leagues connected to the U.S. system? How are Canadian players seen? Lisa, I'm going to throw that one over to you. Cool. Um, so there are certainly, uh, there are certain Canadian preps that are also like a whole nother bubble that like NEPSAC, usually we don't see Canadian prep teams down in the States. Um, but they're more like an operation, like a club hockey team. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll kind of put, put a pin in that one. So how do you get seen? Um, really, it's this advocacy program of like really getting in touch with these coaches and letting them know. And, and I can't emphasize what Mike said earlier, too. It's um, it's got to come from the student um, where, you know, if if someone's going to email me like I need to hear from the student, definitely like copy your parents 100 um, percent. I know not all 13, 14 year old kids have their Gmail ready to rock, um, but that email like I can tell if a parent has written it versus the student and this process, you're the one who's living it. Um, so whether you're Canadian, I've had players from um, Czech, France, um, Canada, like you name it, as long as you're the one advocating um, and this is something you really want, um, doesn't matter where you're from, we'll figure it out. So, you know, the next, the next question that I, that I have, and maybe, you know, Renee will, will call this one the, the last question because I know we're approaching time, right? Are there any of, is there any other advice you know, Nikki, you'll go first. Lisa, you can wrap us up. Is there any other advice you would have for folks? Any other questions they should ask, you know, as they're as they consider kind of the boarding school route? Um, I think um, this is a really great process that can really provide some wonderful in introspection, not just for the student, but for families too, and thinking about this unique journey that is boarding school. So I think having a kind of an assessment between the family and the student about what is best for the for this for the student and their next steps. And really leaning into, I think um, what Lisa said earlier is really sticking with me, right? Do you want to be here, right? And so letting that guide you. So like guiding this process based on 
what sort of outcomes you as a student want to have after your four years. Is it an opportunity to pursue an internship? Is it an opportunity to, you know, really study STEM vigorously? Is it an opportunity to be able to, uh, to be able to be both a scholar and an athlete? Are you looking at a school that's going to provide you with wonderful college options? I think this is a really great opportunity to get in lockstep um, about what you want and making sure that you are asking those questions to those admission officers. Um, and to be honest, admission offices are and should be prepared to answer any question that you have about their school community. It is what they do. And also don't be afraid to ask for contact information. If you wanna to talk to a black identifying student on our campus, you can ask for that. If you wanna to talk to a black identifying faculty member, you can ask for that. If you wanna to speak to any student, if you wanna to speak to a student who's playing ice hockey and it doesn't matter what their racial makeup is, you can ask for that. Um, so I would say, making sure that any question you have that is on your mind gets asked. Um, and oftentimes the way in which people respond to your questions will give you all the information that you need. Um, I think what I would add um, is, is kind of, so I really recommend um, whether it's during a conversation with uh, any of those people that Nikki just shared or any of the interactions you might have um, or if you visited or something, uh, like make a pros and cons list, um, whether it's in the notes of your phone, whether it's sitting, and, and I really, really recommend that like say it's a student and their parent who's gone on the visit, just take a second when you get to the car, student, you do yours, or child, kid, you know, and then parent, you do yours. What stuck out? And then, you know, as you're driving, let it process separately a little. And then maybe you both have questions that you forgot to ask. Cool. Jot them down uh, and, and reach out. And, and any question you might have, like this is, uh, it's a really, you know, I want you to feel empowered in the process. Um, but it's your life. And so you owe it to yourself to anything that feels unsettling or you need more information. Like it's all out there. You just need to, to want it and ask for it. And it's not for everyone. That's okay. That's okay too. Um, but for those who it is like, I had no idea this was something I was going to fall in love with. And it's, it's literally my job and my life. And so I'm really passionate about it, but, um, if it's not for you, it's all good. Yeah, and, and I think I think that's the big thing, right? Not everybody makes it through four years of boarding school, even the ones who wanted to be there. It, it isn't for everyone, but for a lot of people, it is the right thing, right? And so, but the only way you'll you'll know is to continue to investigate, ask questions, use Nikki, Lisa, myself as a resource. And with that, Renee, we'll turn it over to you. This has been such a great conversation. Um, I just want to shout out uh, Lisa and Nikki at your uh, respective schools. If you all are thinking about boarding school, check out uh, Williston, Northampton and Berkshire because they have some amazing programs there. Some amazing hockey is being played there. Uh, and also, you know, we don't want to forget Culver that has been so good to the Watson family um, and has really um, stepped up. Uh, I think we even have a BGHC uh, scholarship alumnus heading, or actually she's in yeah. her first month yeah. of being a, a boarding school student at Culver. So it's a really exciting time for us and we're so glad to be able to have this conversation with you, Nikki, Lisa, and, and Mike. Um, our, I just wanted to remind all of the attendees that if you go to the Eventbrite page, you can find a handy dandy downloadable uh, handout with some of the information that we've talked about today uh, and the contact information of our panelists as well, because like they all have already said, Lisa, Mike, and Nikki are here for you. If you have questions, these are your co-conspirators on campus. So please do reach out. And if you don't remember after you click off this call how to get in touch with them, shoot Black Girl Hockey Club and email, we'll be happy to connect you. That's what we're here for. We're building community. We're building spaces for racialized young women to play hockey as long as they want to.
That's what it's all about. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will be having our second session here in about two hours. It'll be pretty much the same thing, but obviously not the same thing because we kind of went off on some tangents. We had some really good questions. I hope that everyone is able to take something away from this. And we look forward to hearing what your next steps are in your hockey journey. So thank you everyone for joining us. Nikki, Lisa, Mike, I'll see you in a couple hours. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. Great everyone. evening. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.